you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is uh, part two of the re-examining the exercise selection criteria. I'm here with Nikki Sims and Noah Hayden. We're going to continue our conversation. We talked last time about all of those physical attributes that we're trying to improve with the ultimate goal of improving our quality of life. And that leads us to a quick review of those things. Those major physical attributes are strength, endurance, power, mobility and flexibility, agility and coordination, precision and body awareness, then beyond what we often get defined in other physical attributes, we have body composition, lack of debilitating pain or resiliency, and mental fortitude. And so when those are the ultimate goals of the things we're trying to improve, you then started to think about those things and said, okay, now, how do we find the exercises or how do we define the exercise selection criteria that would best improve that entire list? Is that true? Is that kind of how you approach this? Yeah, I wanted to know what the goalpost was first, but then, you know, for a long time, we had three criteria that we would use, right? Yep. Use the most muscle mass over the longest effective range of motion to lift the most weight. Yep. And again, after sort of repopulating the list of fitness attributes, that sounds like criteria just for strength. Yes. You know, just for barbell lifting. That's like barbell lifting selection criteria. Yes. Not really a fitness attribute selection criteria, right? Yep. Yeah, that's good. So then as you apply this, you'll still hear some familiar parts of that because that's not wrong. It's maybe, I think the way we look at it is maybe it's not complete for trying to improve all of these fitness attributes. It's abbreviated, right? Yeah. And, you know, I also think that, again, I don't think I came up with anything new with these criteria. I think that basically everything in here was already known and, you know, implied by any good coach. I just wanted to write it out really for myself to be a little bit more clear about what I'm actually trying to achieve. Excellent. So take us through that. Take us through the first one. So the first one is train the most muscle mass. Now, I think this came out of the academy, didn't it? Yep. Changing use to train. Yes. And I think that that's a huge difference. It's a big reason why I actually don't have many of my clients doing an Olympic press anymore. Yes. Same. You know, with a hip thrust, because it's kind of a competitive lift. Yep. Which is okay. I mean, I still do it. I love doing it but I think that it puts it in a different context. Yeah, more of a strict overhead press trains the muscles we're trying to train, the muscles of the shoulders, the muscles of the triceps. Through the whole range of motion of the press. Through the whole range of motion. Yeah, that's exactly right. Whereas if we throw the bar, whether that's with the hips or if it's like with a push press, with a, you know, a knee flexion and explosion, then you would say, well, are we training the quads? Are we training the muscles around the hips? Like, no, that it's not really heavy enough to train them. Right. It's using them to help throw the weight. But I'd rather get, I think we have more effective training doing that movement more controlled and strict for the muscles we're trying to train. So training the most muscle mass is a big piece of this. Mm -hmm. And then next. All right. Second one is in normal, predictable movement patterns. I like that. Yeah. In normal predictable movement patterns. Yep. Love it. Really what this comes down to is that a, so I don't want to bash CrossFit, but CrossFit is not training. The conventional approach of CrossFit is not training its performance, right? Sure. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think CrossFit as a sport is, it can be kind of fun and it's done a lot, I think, for the fitness industry across the world, really. Yeah. But one of the big advantages of barbell training is that it is a highly controlled environment that you can do things inside of. Mm -hmm. Everything can be controlled in that setting. And not just the weights on the bar and all of that. The temperature and humidity can be controlled. The lighting can be controlled. The noise can be controlled. The levelness of the floor, you know, sure. whether the floor is wet or not. I remember watching one of the CrossFit games. They had platforms outside and a bunch of people slipped while they were doing a, a heavy jerk. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's not draining. That's crazy. No, no that's, it's out of control. Yeah. So I think that that needs to be one of the criteria when picking exercises to achieve those things, because we're going to be doing them a lot. Yes. We need consistency. And if you do something that's not predictable over and over and over again, you're eventually going to have some sort of a mistake happen, some sort of an accident happen. Which is actually, when you think about that, why CrossFit is more like a sport, right? So playing football is not predictable. You don't know what the guy that you're sort of, you know, if you're a wide receiver and you've got a cornerback on you, you don't know exactly how he's going to try to cover you. The cornerback doesn't know the route the receiver is going to run. Exactly. None of it's predictable, but we use these predictable and biologically normal movement patterns, right? Right. You can really think them out. Like humans were designed to do these things, right? You watch two-year-olds go through completely normal, full range of motion squats. You know, these presses and squats and pulls and these, you know, having a hip hinge, for lack of a better word, sort of a cringy word, but it's that idea, right, of a hip going from flexion to extension. These are all very normal things that we were designed to do. And so we do those things in a very controlled environment, which I love that. Next. Third one is requiring normal coordination when possible, which basically just means stand up. Yeah. Stand up and force your body to maintain balance while doing movements. Yeah. Load the axial skeleton, right? And I also like to choose the term normal. So it's really, it's like requiring normal, but not exceptional skill and coordination. Right. Like earthquake bars are the dumbest invention that anyone ever came up with in a fever dream. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's right. You've mentioned balance so much when you said in the article, throw out both balls and earthquake bars, because like, why would you intentionally limit yourself on one of the most important things that will allow you (laughs) to perform (laughs) like yeah right when i think of those things you've got one of two outcomes from that one the load is going to be so submaximal because you've made it so difficult or two you're going to hurt yourself because it's so unpredictable right both of those aren't really the best way to make long-term progress so it's not very helpful for much right this is why we don't use things like the overhead squat it doesn't require normal skill like that's a very difficult movement. The amount of coordination and skill that it requires is very high. It's also why we don't teach a snatch typically to a beginner, to a novice. A snatch is a high skill movement. It's a great power movement. It's a movement that athletes can do. And the athletes that have already gained a good solid level of body awareness and skill can certainly do those things. But when we're trying to look at bang for the buck, we want those normal movement patterns that require just normal skill. The idea is like a squat, I can teach you know, the freakiest of athletes how to squat, but I can also teach an 85 year old lady how to squat. And that's what I love about those movements like a squat, a deadlift. Who can't deadlift? You get them training on day one. Day one, you start making changes. Yeah, that's right. Day one, right? You don't have to be like, well, we're going to start the process of teaching how to snatch. Like, no, we're going to squat today Mm -hmm. and we're going to deadlift today because almost certainly while some people can't squat, almost everybody can deadlift. Yeah. So you can pick those movements. Okay. Number four. Number four. Over the longest effective range of motion. Yep. So that one stays. The same one that everyone's used to hearing. Yep. And there are, again, that word effective matters, right? There are times when you can move the weight or the barbell even further with the greatest length or range of motion, but it's not necessarily the most effective. I have a question that when you're talking about the longest effective range of motion, are we looking at the joint? Are we looking at the barbell? What is experiencing the longest effective range of motion. What do you think, Matt? Well, I think that it's the joint, but I think we use the barbell as the way that's most easy to see that, right? It's pretty hard to see in a compound movement because you're always talking about multiple joints. Right. To see, so the how much the barbell moves requires multiple joints to go through range of motion, whereas it takes a coach of exceptional skill and sort of vision to see like, oh, the, you know, the elbow's, got a little more flexion, right. all the shoulders got a little more extension there. Like that's sort of hard to divide that up. And as the barbell moves a longer range of motion, then you know that in general, more work, literally the definition of work, more work was completed. So I think we often watch the barbell, but I think what that's telling us is that the joints or the muscles went through, they did more work because they had to move the joints themselves through a longer range of motion. Like the joints that are controlled by the most amount of muscle are doing the work. Contributing 
Yeah, I think it can be looked at both ways, you know? Yeah. I think that just looking at the bar moving in space and how far it goes is helpful. No one's doing this on the platform, really. This is more of a contemplation of a particular design of a movement. And I think it can be helpful to think, you know, like in a squat, how deep should I have people right. be trying to go in the squat? And thinking about what that means for the hips and what that means for the ankles and the knees, you know? I think that can be helpful. I think that's where it came up once before was like, well, if you went deeper in the squat and someone was strong enough to maintain lumbar extension and go to a more significant depth, then are you training the knees with a more effective range of motion? Sure. Right. And the answer might be yes. But I do think in the squat, we do actually look at, so for example, if we did a high bar squat or a front squat to just below parallel and a low bar squat that's more, you know, hips back bent over to just below parallel, the amount of barbell movement is going to be very, very similar. But where we're placing that load or where we're placing those forces, that changes. And we do look at that as a coach all the time. Every day when you break down your client videos, if their knees are a little too far forward, or sometimes they do the opposite, they, you know, they come up out of the hole and their knees shoot back and their butt shoots back, you fix those, right? Like those are things you fix. And inevitably, like regardless of what style of squat they do or what sort of form errors they might have there, the barbell is going to move about the same distance. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And so you're kind of trying to, okay, let's put a little more force back here. Let's take it off of this area. And so that's where you get to have fun playing the physics game and figure out like, where do you want the moment? Where do you want the force? And also, I think when you have a good knowledge of that, when someone has an injury, you're able to make adjustments to allow the body to still move through full range of motion without overloading that injury. So you can take some of that force off the injured area, off the injured joint, which typically injuries right. occur around joints and put it in a place that can handle a little more of the load. So we do think about that some. Five is to lift the most weight. And yeah. so I wrote this in the article. I think that there's a lot of overlap with this. And I don't think that it's really the point. So you can lift more weight by having a shorter range of motion. Yeah, of course. Right. It's what all power lifters do. And you can have a longer range of motion and lift less weight. Yep. So you're not really trying to lift the most weight. You're trying to lift whatever weight you can lift through the longest effective range of motion. Yeah. So I think that it's missing the point. Yeah. That seems to be like more of a programming consideration than sure. I think it should fit into like the exercise selection. Correct. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good point. Yeah, because the amount of weight on the bar actually doesn't. Well, here's where it changes with exercise selection. Instead of thinking about, and this is often we think about, you know, a heavier squat versus a lighter squat. But the way to think about it is a squat versus a leg extension. But the ability of these big compound movements because they're compound movements, because they use the most muscle mass, because they like all of these sort of things, because of that, they're able to move more weight. If you do a single joint isolation exercise, it uses less weight by its very nature because it's less muscle. Right. And so it sort of is supportive of that. So rather than thinking about more weight versus less weight in the same movement, you think about more weight versus less weight across different movements that train the same muscle groups or similar muscle groups, right? So when we're talking about the longest effective range of motion, training the most muscle mass over that range of motion, it's implied that we're doing that because it's biomechanically a way to lift more weight. That's right. But I think that that's a little derivative and it doesn't need to be a criteria for a lift per se. Actually, it's a really good point. You know, or else we wouldn't overhead press because it's not that much weight. You can bench press instead. Right. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So that is structurally sustainable. And the point of this one is if somebody can't do a movement without hurting themselves, it's really not worth doing. So like as an example, you can lift more weight by bench pressing right down to the shoulder joint and right back up, but that's not going to last very long. That's going to be a, right. a disaster in a hurry. Yeah. Right. That structurally sustainable means it doesn't cause impingement or pain. And that's important because it goes back to our fitness attributes, one of which is not being debilitating pain. <laughs> that, that's right. right. It's sort of real important. Now, again, and you said this at the beginning, Noah, that a lot of these are sort of self-evident and it's true, but I still think it's really important to write down. We have to remember that these things have to be structurally sustainable. And by the way, it's one of the reasons why some people can't do squats. 
right. as we start to get into, as we apply these practically, if the structurally sustainable criteria is not in there, then you force everyone to do squats. Exactly. And I think the vast majority of people should do squats. But for people that it's not structurally sustainable, if they have constant debilitating pain from doing squats, then they shouldn't squat. And we do see this in a senior population. And they won't over a long enough period of time, right? That's right. If you're the coach that says, well, you just need to suck it up because everyone needs to do squats because they're such a great movement, that person's not going to pay you for very long. That's right. Well, and it doesn't get better. It rarely fixes anything or helps. Yeah, I think that there's obviously a lot of value. Let's say someone has a hard time getting into a low bar back squat position with their shoulders. I think there's a lot of value in if they're borderline working on their flexibility and trying to ease them into that over time. I think that that's the way to go. And I do that frequently. But there are some people that it's pretty obvious you can maybe improve their shoulder flexibility a little bit, but they're never going to be able to low bar back squat. Just have a safety squat bar. There's nothing wrong with that, right? So again, that's right. they can still squat, but just in a way that's structurally sustainable, right? It's maybe slightly less ideal than your perfect, comfortable example of a squat, but that's okay. <laughs> so comfortable. The question is, and I've thought about this a lot lately, is how much less ideal is it actually? People love to get in these arguments about like low bar versus high bar, safety squat bar, a box squat. So if we have all decided, and I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast who would disagree with this, but if we've decided the low bar back squat is the pinnacle of squats, but for whatever reason, we can't do that. So we have to high bar squat because we've got shoulder issues or a safety squat bar squat, or because we struggle with full range of motion and we kind of want to take some pressure off the knees, we put them on a box. How much is the ROI reduced? Because I would argue for almost all of those, we're talking about like 5% or less. So you're like, well, well you get 95% of the value, right? Without the debilitating pain. I would argue that the ROI is almost the same or that it's a moot point, I guess, because if someone can't low bar back squat, right, then that's not even on the table, right? It's not like we're going to be in some alternate universe somewhere else where we've decided to low bar squat and endure the pain and be like, I got 15 more pounds out of this. It was totally worth it. Like you have no idea. So let me give you an example, though, where somebody can do both. So I was coaching and everybody knows Dr. Pewter. And he's, what is Dr. Peter, like six foot 11? <laughs> he's not, but he's real tall. He's like six, six, right? He's really six, 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 seven. And the way it's just working out for his life right now, he is training, he's really into rowing. So he's, you know, he's a collegiate rower, high level collegiate rower. And there's a pretty good gym at the boathouse, I guess in the attic of the boathouse. It must be pretty solid because when he deadlifts, the floor doesn't rattle. It always freaks me out. It's a wood floor. And I'm like, woof. That's surprising. <laughs> but he can't overhead press standing because, you know, the roof is too low. And so I've just got him overhead pressing. He's doing seated overhead presses without a back support. And I'm like, you know, for his schedule, it works out perfect. And it would be a giant pain in the butt to try to figure out how to press standing up outside. He's got to carry the weight down. Like, You're fine. Right. Right. What's the reduction in return on investment for him? in sitting down for his presses right now? 5% maybe. You know that he's not going to go outside every single time no. with a bunch of weights and then bring it all back in. So you're going to lose consistency right. there, right? But this sounds like a great argument to have on Instagram. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, real fun. <laughs> so anyway, so there's an example. It's not always a structurally sustainable thing. Sometimes it's just a like, you know, it's what access do you have to what equipment? Yeah. This schedule stuff. So those things matter too. Okay. And then the last one. With exercises that have a wide therapeutic window. What does that mean? Yeah, explain that one. So you can maybe do a really high quality and useful kettlebell movement. But as soon as that becomes a little easy and you've adapted to it, usually the next step up in kettlebell weights is so big that you're not going to be able to make that jump. You need to be able to have minute increments on whatever movement it is that you're going to select for your clients. I mean, being able to start extremely low and being able to go extremely high, you know? Yeah. You can't always just add five foods. Yes. This is the big, I was thinking about this this morning, not thinking about this conversation, but this is the major drawback of chins. There is no warm up for chins. Like my first chin up is 255 pounds, the first rep, right? And so this is why for an older population, often general population, this is why we like the lat pull down so much mm -hmm. because anybody can do a lat pull down. You know, Sybil is never doing a chin up, but she does lat pull downs every single workout. 
And so, and I love chin-ups. Let me be clear. If you can do chin-ups, you can do pull-ups, actually like every different sort of grip that you can use. I'd like to be able to, you certainly can, once you get decent at them, you could start to titrate weight up and add weight, but there isn't really a warm-up portion of that. Like you've got to reach a pretty significant level of strength to ever do one chin-up. And you know, we've made videos on this, how to get your first chin-up. Nobody ever makes a video about how to get your first lat pull-down, because you just use one plate. We use five pound or 10 pound plate and you do a lat pull down. So this is the drawback there. So yeah, the exercise with a wide therapeutic window I like because it basically is identifying the vast majority of population can do them regardless of their strength. It's titratable from very light to very heavy. It also kind of satisfies the most amount of weight possible criteria because the most amount of weight possible might be 52 pounds. Right, exactly. 54 pounds would be too much. Right. Yeah, when the most amount of weight possible for some people is 12 and a half pounds and for other people is 250 pounds. Yeah. That's great. If that exercise allows you to do both, awesome. So it's not just about the widest therapeutic window for an individual, it's across all human populations as well, right? I think that's important. So a quick recap there is, so the exercise selection criteria then that you use is to train the most muscle mass in normal, predictable movement patterns and normal biological movements requiring normal coordination when possible over the longest effective range of motion, which was self-evident to lift the most weight, that these movements must be structurally sustainable and with exercises that have a wide therapeutic window. So you've taken the criteria from three to seven, but again, I think it's more accurate. It's more precise. Well, six, six of them because we took out the lift most weight. If we throw out to lift the most weight. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna be like, Barbara Logic doesn't stand for strength anymore. Well, the strength community is going to be outraged. <laughs> <laughs> they told us we don't have to squat and that the most amount of weight doesn't matter. <laughs> I was trying to create an exercise criteria that wasn't barbell specific. Mm. You know, we'll talk more about it in the programming criteria. But, you know, this applies to conditioning as well. Like what movement you would pick to do hit with. Right. You could just pick up a rock and do hit with that or something, but how do you add two pounds to that? You know, and how safe is that? How structurally sustainable is it? Yes. So I wanted it to be more universal. I like that. So when we apply this exercise selection criteria, surprise, surprise, no one's going to be surprised by this. Most often you're going to end up with movements like a variation on the squat. You know, squats work for most, yep. right? Not all, but pulls, vertical pulls like chin ups and Horizontal pulls like rows. I mean, obviously all muscles pull, so it's not a great word, but it's, I think people understand what I mean. Presses, right? Uh, vertical presses like the press. Horizontal presses like the bench press. Again, not crazy about the term hip hinge, but things that make the hips go from closed to open, which squats also do, but a deadlift, those big heavy deadlift type pickup heavy things movement become the things that we often do as well as, like you said, often potentially a low impact, low skill movement, such as a prowler or sled push or echo bike, you know, for the ability to do something like a high intensity interval or some sort of conditioning component. So, mm -hmm. and it narrows that for most people, that infinite number of exercises that they can do when they walk into the big Lifetime Fitness Globo Gym down to just a handful of exercises that feels more manageable and that you now know can give you the greatest bang for your buck. So this is where the programming criteria started. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got exercise selection criteria. How do you know when you're done? That's right. How do you know when that's as many times as you need to go through that? Yes. You know, do you need 15 movements? Do you need one? What is it? Yes. And so it all started with this first programming criteria. You've got to make sure that your program is comprehensive. You've got to make sure that all major muscle groups are trained. Yes. Which again, is the only reason really to include the press, the overhead press, if you're bench pressing. You know, it doesn't really train the traps in the way that the overhead press does. And so it's very useful to include another pressing movement. Yes, I like that. So yeah, the last part of this article and this discussion that you've had is, and you take those things and apply these five basic programming criteria. I've thought about this one a lot and I've changed them a little bit. I want you to tell me yours, and then I'll tell you my sort of counterpoint, which they're super similar, but I've thought through them a lot. So the first thing that you identify in this programming criteria is that comprehensive piece. And I started thinking about, before we actually get to the criteria, 
what are we trying to accomplish again? Which for programming, I identified these three primary things, which is it's comprehensive. We want it to be simple and efficient, right? Because we don't want to train for three hours and it needs to be hard. It's because easy doesn't work. So intense might be a good word, although that often means like magnitude or how heavy it is. So that's not really what I'm talking about. So what is your first programming criteria? Train all major muscle groups. You have to make sure that the entire body is trained, not using all major muscle groups. You have to train all major muscle groups. So, yes. you know, you could go through the exercise selection criteria and probably end up with the squat as the thing that best satisfies. I think I said this in the article too, as a lift that sort of best satisfies all of those criteria, but you're not really training your biceps or triceps or shoulders yes. in any of that. You're not training your grip in that. So you need something else, right? You're not training your pecs. And so you have to go back through the exercise selection criteria to find something else that maybe doesn't use all the muscle mass in the body, right? But it uses as many of those untrained muscle groups as possible, which would be the press yes. or the bench, right? And that's why you would include it, even though the bench is kind of an isolation movement and it's kind of lame a little bit, I think, but whatever. Excuse me. <laughs> So I love that first criteria of training all the muscle groups. As I've done this in the seminar, I say, and I want to get your thoughts on this. And if you don't like it, you tell me. I said, my first is to train to improve all aspects of fitness, which is comprehensive. I like that. By training all of the major muscle groups, which is also comprehensive. So those first two steps fulfill the comprehensive component, right? Because mm -hmm. we are trying to improve all those aspects of fitness. Okay. So then your next one is... With the least number of exercises as is practical. Agreed completely. That's my next one too. You could probably shorten that like what you said earlier, something about as with, you know, the simplest effective number of exercises or something like that. Yeah, but I still like the way you've worded that. And I said it too, with the least number of exercises as is practical, and that fulfills the simple and efficient component. Right. So when we think about these three primary components, we can actually look at your criteria and see which one they fulfill. Okay, next that do not interfere with other adaptations. So this really is, I mean, it applies to a lot of things, but this is really talking about conditioning, a conditioning component that on day one, a beginner in the gym that's just learning how to squat and deadlift and press shouldn't be going out and running five miles afterwards because they're just going to hit a wall. Nothing is going to work. So you have to make sure that whatever the primary focus is, the primary attribute that you're trying to adapt isn't being interfered with from the other things that you do in your training. But I would argue instead that really whatever your focus is, you should be trying to have a program that interferes the least with the other adaptations always. That's right. That's right. I just changed the wording a tiny bit there. I just said that do not largely negatively interfere with the other adaptations. There you go. Right? Yeah, I like that. So when we consider things like conditioning, we do those low impact, low skill, things like a sled push, rather than a, you know, a running on hard pavement, both of which would fulfill the conditioning criteria, but the running on pavement would largely negatively interfere with the other adaptations, primarily strength. Right. Whereas the push in the sled is going to interfere a little bit, but not very much, and maybe none. And it doesn't have a loaded eccentric phase like running does. That's exactly right. It doesn't make you sore. That's exactly right. Or cycling. Right. I've had people before that really like to cycle, and I say, just do that, because yeah. you won't get beat up from it. You'll be all right. That's right. Yep. When would strength training compromise the other physical attributes? Would it just be when you don't have the time resource to do the other ones? Well, one situation that I can think of is... If you have another sport that's like a focus in your life, you know, there's probably a time when you really need to not have the most effective training of muscles if you have to perform for some other sport. And so, you know, you'd have to adjust things for that. Yeah, it sounds more like the recovery bucket. Yeah. It's a budget too, right? We've talked about this before. If you decide to spend all of your money on strength training and strength training alone, that is going to have an effect, a negative effect on the other stuff, right? Like we all see the 300 pound power lifters who just try to get strong to just to get strong. And for them, that's the primary goal. But you wouldn't look at them and say like, you know, they're not 
probably very mobile, don't have good body composition. They probably don't, you know. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we're trying to find a good balance here. So, okay, next. This next one kind of ties into that, too, because most conditioning components need to be done to failure. And some sort of bodybuilding accessory movements need to be done to failure as well, right? Yep. So any movement that is done to failure must be as low skill as possible. Yep. So again, a great reason why nobody really should be doing ring dips for time. Right. Because you're going to hurt yourself or snatches for time, yep. whatever. It's a precision movement that's unpredictable and you're going to get hurt over a long enough timeline. Yes. The muscle fatigue will inhibit the skill, which is necessary to perform the exercise versus right. the muscle fatigue being the limiting factor as it should be. Yes. Yep. That's good. And then the last one. In the minimum effective dose required to continue making progress. That's good. That's a nice blanket, broad stroke term for a huge topic. Oh, that MED. <laughs> <laughs> I just said using a basic progression, i.e. increase in stress, via the minimum effective dose required to continue to make progress. So I actually made it a little longer, but yours says exactly what you need to say. So that's great. And this has been really good. So you really start with the why. Why are we doing this in general? What are the things we're trying to improve with the physical attributes, which we covered in the last episode? Mm -hmm. Once we identify that, what are the exercise selection criteria? And then once we know what exercises we're going to do, how do we lay them out in a program? And so we also then have general programming criteria. And it sort of ends with that MED principles. You sort of kind of tossed up the softball to that sort of simple over complex and intensity over volume and efficiency over excess. We can run with it from there. So understanding the big picture philosophy allows you then, if you really understand it, if you really grasp this, it allows you then to begin to apply the practical, which I love. I tried to make this like a roadmap that when you're lost a little bit with a certain client, you can come back to this. This is why I included that last criteria, because this sort of tells you when it's time to go back and reassess and go back to the start. So an example of this would be when to add in chin-ups or like when to start doing barbell rows or something. You know, when you first start doing deadlifts, yes. that's plenty of work on your lats right? It is training that muscle mass. It doesn't train it for a really long time. You're going to need some more direct work on that. But following this is kind of a foolproof way of knowing when it's time to add in some of those other things, when it's time to add in certain accessories, all of that. Yes, that's good. I would add for that last item of the programming criteria in the minimum effective dose required to continue making progress, that seems like the opportunity to really account for what your client can commit to training when, you know, life is a little more difficult and training opportunity gets a little bit challenged. So like, you know, you can adjust the dosage or you can decrease the dosage. And sometimes satisfying that continue to make progress criteria means the amount of stress applied is quite low, but that means that they don't stop. So that's how progress is measured at that point. But it maintains the longevity of progress. And I also think, I don't think that I elaborated on this in the article, but what is the progress you're trying to make, right? Going back and reassessing that with the client, like what exactly is their goal? What is their progress metric yeah. that's important to them? And if that metric, like we talked about, is less pain or body composition or speed or something, right? Then what's the minimum effective dose to make that metric go up? Yeah. Because that's the reason why they're there and that's their buy-in. And that's your real job as a coach, not necessarily making them stronger or making them faster or whatever. Yeah, I like that. I like the idea and just thinking through almost sending a basic questionnaire or survey to our clients on some routine basis that sort of takes those major physical attributes and has them sort of either rank them or on a scale of one to 10, you know, help your coach understand what's the most important to you. That way you can kind of see this is actually really important to me to do this thing. Or if it's an other, which the other could be training for sport, right? So if there's a specific event you're training for, maybe that's one that's not an actual physical attribute, but then the coach can look and say, well, you know, Nikki's training for an upcoming Brazilian jiu-jitsu contest. She also needs to cut seven pounds to make the weight class that she wants or whatever that is. It gives the coach a better insight in what they're looking to do. So that's where I think that physical attribute piece comes in really handy is to go, okay, what's most important to you? That's good. It's good. It's been a good discussion, good brainstorming yeah, dude. session, man. I really appreciate you putting this thing together and thinking through it. Like I said, it's been 
really good for me to chew on this. I've had long conversations with Nikki and Andrew and Hambrick and all sorts of people on this to chew on. And it's really made me think. And I think it's always good. It's one of the things I love about Barbell Logic is it brings so many good coaches to the table and it's constantly refining what we know. And, you know, sometimes that may change some of our thoughts about something. It often, though, just helps us become a little more precise or a little more accurate about what we already thought. And so I think that's what you did here with sort of reexamining and rethinking the exercise criteria. It wasn't throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It was going like, okay, this is a good start, but does it really fulfill everything that we're trying to do? And so I think you've done a really good job there. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. This has been another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. Thanks for listening. Did a little two-part series here on all this fun considerations about programming and exercise criteria. If you got value out of this podcast, we would love a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And as always, if you want a personalized coach for you, we will set you up with your own coach at Barbell Logic. Your first month is always free. Noah is a coach for us. You can always request him as well. Nikki and I are probably full, so you can't request us. But Noah's smarter than we are anyway, so just request him. So, <laughs> Yeah, honestly, at this point, I think you should work with Noah instead of me. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you guys next week. Bye.